Have you ever wondered why a particular chord under one set of circumstances can give you a sense of satisfaction and completion, while under another set of circumstances that same chord leaves you dissatisfied and craving for some kind of musical resolve? The answer lies within a set of blueprints barely perceived within each and every tone. The blueprints are called overtones. When we listen to a single musical tone, particularly a deeply pitched musical tone, It is a fact that our ears are actually perceiving, in addition to the lowest, loudest tone, a combination of many more subtle tones having an abundance of diverse pitches. For example, a low C played on a piano expresses not only itself, but simultaneously and far more faintly. The C an octave higher. the G above that, the C again above that, the E above that, the G above that, and many, many more tones. This phenomenon has to do with how a column of air, a bowed or plucked string, or hammered piano string, vibrates. Before going further, we need to keep in mind that the frequency of a vibration determines the pitch of a tone. The lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. When we look at a vibrating string very closely, we will see that it does not merely swing back and forth only at its outermost ends. On careful examination, the string seems to be vibrating at every single point along its entire length. And in fact, that is exactly what it is doing. In reality, the string does vibrate along its entire length at its lowest pitch and frequency. But the string simultaneously vibrates at one half its length at twice the frequency, one third its length at three times the frequency, one quarter of its length at four times the frequency, one fifth its length at five times the frequency, on and on, ad infinitum, dividing its length and multiplying its frequency, until every possible combination of points along the length of string are vibrating at their own discrete frequencies, yielding their own discrete pitches. When we sound the piano's low C, which we refer to as a fundamental tone, or sometimes the first partial harmonic, vibration occurs at the outermost ends of the string. This has the lowest frequency, the lowest pitch, and is the loudest to our ears. The other transmitted tones are called overtones. Each overtone is successively higher in pitch and frequency, and all overtones are quite faint when compared to the fundamental tone, with some being inaudible to the ear. But their existence and order of occurrence within each and every tone provides a blueprint for relationships between the overtones that helps our brains organize and make sense of the music that we hear. How, then, shall we demonstrate the existence and arrangement of overtones that are nearly, or in some cases completely, inaudible to the ear? As it happens, we can make use of the piano and a principle known as sympathetic vibration to provide evidence for their existence and order of occurrence. The principle of sympathetic vibration tells us that when any two objects that vibrate at the same frequency, for example, two tuning forks of the same pitch, get near to one another, inciting one of those objects to vibrate, in this case, by striking one of the tuning fork, will cause the other object to vibrate and sound, without physical contact. 
Returning to our example of the piano's fundamental of low C, we learn that the first overtone produced occurs at the C one octave higher. We also learn that in addition to total string length, vibration occurs independently at one half the string length of the low C which means that it vibrates at a frequency which is exactly twice that of the low C. The frequency of the first overtone for the low C is identical to the frequency of the fundamental for the C one octave higher and, therefore, produces a tone which is exactly one octave higher than our original low C. Let's make use of the piano and this principle of sympathetic vibration to demonstrate the existence of this first overtone. If we very gently depress the piano key for the C one octave higher than low C, we can silently lift the damper off of the string so that the string will be free to vibrate. If we now very quickly and forcefully strike our fundamental tone, the low C, the frequency for the first overtone will begin its vibration. Since the frequency for the first overtone contained within the low C is identical to the fundamental of the C one octave higher, then a sympathetic vibration will occur and the C one octave higher than our low C will begin to vibrate and sound like this. And we now have evidence that the first overtone does indeed exist within our fundamental of low C. We can demonstrate the existence of the second overtone using this same technique. We recall that this is the G immediately above our previous first overtone of C. For this overtone, the string length of our fundamental tone divides into thirds, giving us a frequency which is three times that of the fundamental low C. The frequency for our second overtone is identical to the fundamental of the G above our previous C. By silently depressing this G while forcefully striking the fundamental of low C, we then hear And once again, we provide evidence of the existence of this second overtone and its order of occurrence within our fundamental of low C. Lastly, for the purposes of this discussion, the third overtone for low C, which is the fundamental string length divided into quarters, vibrating at four times its frequency, shares its frequency with the fundamental C located immediately above our second overtone of G. There are two patterns that can be observed within these first few overtones which establishes in our ears two significant musical relationships. Both relationships have to do with our ears' subconscious organization of and expectations for these overtones when we hear them played as fundamentals within the melody or harmony of any musical piece. Let's make a couple of simple observations. Even within just the first four, we see that the most frequently repeated overtones are duplications of the C fundamental at various octaves. A second observation is that the first different tone from the C fundamental is the G overtone. And that G is surrounded on all sides by versions of the C fundamental. The G is located five steps above the C below, or four steps below the C above. The importance of these distances will be made clear shortly. The first musical relationship that becomes apparent from these observations is that the prevalence of the fundamental tone sends a message to our ears that this tone has some particular significance. Our ears interpret these repeated fundamental overtones as anchor tones to which all the other overtones are connected, around which all the other overtones revolve, and to which all the other overtones seek to return. As evidence of this, one has only to look at and hear a typical musical excerpt. Listen for a moment to a small sample of the second movement to Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 1.
In order to more clearly see the various musical relationships, we can reduce the music to a more essential form by removing some of its ornamentation. We can now observe how often the C fundamental, or its chord, occurs as indicated within the red circles. As we listen to the piece again, notice that the non-circled chords built on overtones other than the fundamental seem to be subservient to and actually direct us back to the red circled fundamentals. Turning our attention to the final chord, and particularly the final bass note of the piece, we see that it constitutes a final return to the fundamental tone upon which the piece ultimately rests and reaches its conclusion. A second relationship developed from this initial overtone pattern which affects the way in which our ears organize music is the introduction of a different tone, G, the second overtone, into the field of duplicated fundamentals. This different tone creates an auditory sense of tension and movement away from the fundamental. which seeks to be resolved within the ear by a movement back to the fundamental. This movement back to the fundamental can be accomplished by rising to the next fundamental, or falling to the previous fundamental. When listening to real-world musical compositions that use the C as a fundamental, we refer to the G as a dominant tone, because as soon as we hear the G in the context of C, our ears anticipate or are dominated by the G for a return to the C fundamental. This anticipation is not so urgent that the return to C is immediately demanded, in other words, one can musically linger on the G, but the ear will not be satisfied until there is an eventual and direct return from the G to the C. Listen again to the reduction of our Beethoven excerpt. Pay attention to how Beethoven uses the G chord to create movement away from the C, but in every case uses that same G chord to simultaneously push us back to the C chords that follow. Take particular note of the fact that the two final chords, G to C, provide our ears with a sense of finality and a sense of completeness. We can walk away from the piece feeling satisfied that the song has reached its end and that there is no more music to follow. Up to now, our discussion has been based only on a fundamental of C. But if we examine the fundamentals and associated harmonics for any other tone, a D or an E, for example, we discover that the overtone pattern is consistently repeated regardless of the selected fundamental tone. An A fundamental, for example, is duplicated and arranged in the same pattern as occurs for a C fundamental. Low A, a an octave higher, another A an octave higher still, and in between a first different overtone of E, which is situated five steps above the A below or four steps below the A above. Using G as a fundamental tone, we find exactly the same pattern and arrangement. The low G, a G one octave higher, and another G one octave higher yet again. The first different tone is a D, which is located five steps above the G below, or four steps below the G above. Thus, the two musical relationships previously discussed hold true regardless of the fundamental tone selected. In all cases, the fundamental tone becomes an anchor around which the overtones organize, and the dominant tone urges for a return to the fundamental or a sense of resolution.
To demonstrate, let's listen to our Beethoven reduction again, and we'll perform it using the three different fundamentals of C, F-sharp, and B-flat to make the point that tonal relationships remain consistent regardless of the fundamental chosen. We already know that when C is the fundamental tone, the G is dominant. Notice, however, that when F-sharp becomes the fundamental tone, a C-sharp is dominant. From the first few tones, our ears immediately recognize that this is the same tune using a new fundamental tone of F-sharp, and our brains anticipate that there should and will be an appropriate change to a dominant tone of C-sharp. We observe again that when the fundamental tone is changed to a B-flat, an F-natural becomes the dominant tone. Once again, our ears recognize that this by now familiar tune has been changed to a B-flat fundamental, and our brains once again anticipate the change to a dominant tone of F-natural. As discussed, the introduction of the second overtone or dominant tone into the field of fundamentals creates a sense of tension and a demand for a return to the fundamental tone. We can easily demonstrate this sense of tension and resultant demand by simply sounding the dominant while denying our ears a return to the fundamental. Listen once again to our Beethoven excerpt, this time simply doing away with the final C fundamental at the end of the piece. In this instance, our ears become dissatisfied with the sense of incompletion. We are left with an almost physical tenseness to return to the fundamental tone around which this entire tune has been constructed. These are just two in a variety of ways in which overtones help our ears to organize and make sense of music. The truth is that the organization of our entire modern Western 12-tone system of music is born out of the overtone series. This video is meant to help you understand the origin of two of the most basic precepts of music composition and theory, the concept of key center and the dominant to tonic relationship. I hope we have succeeded in that aim.